Welcome back to yet another ground up SCX24 build. And today we're gonna to be focusing on this little guy ripper chassis. So that is what you see here bagged up at the rear of the table. So they provide you the cage, the tub, the interior, all the body parts, the hardware for their kit, and the actual chassis rails themselves. And now they actually include their billet high clearance ripper links and a billet emac servo tray so quite a bit of value right there in that kit but we are going to need a few extra parts to get this guy rolling so that's what you see on the table laid out here to go with this build so this being new to me there's going to be some discovery so i've got some different motor options laid out here i don't have wheels and tires on the table because again that's going to be per setup per clearances and uh, I think other than that, I've got everything ready to go here. So let's dive into these bagged Ripper chassis kit parts, take a look at what's included, and then we'll get going on the build. We'll do a quick fly through of all these parts and pieces. So this is the uh, little interior segment here. So you've got your two seats, your interior console dash and wheel and those attach back to this cross bracket that then bolts into the cage. And of course we've got our tube sliders and tube fender wraps. We've got our little bikini top. We've got a little back cargo tray and then the tub itself. And we've got the chassis rails and then the transmission. And then you can see this little shape at the back of the chassis so that actually keys in to the transmission. So there's only, there's only one way to put in this transmission tray. You cannot flip it within that chassis. And then they give you the uh, female drive shafts front and rear. And then we've got our hood grill radiator, winch, assembly. We've got our battery ESC tray and inner fenders. And for some reason I have a gray inner fender and a black inner fender, which I would have loved those to both be black so I didn't have to paint them. We've got our windshield and then we actually have our one piece cage. And this thing is just super nice. Like the print job, this is like high quality Shapeways. Just feels like a model kit is what it feels like. Um, and then all the test fitting I've done, everything just fits together seamlessly. And of course you get uh, their well-labeled as usual hardware kits so that's great um, no instructions but that pretty much tells you what to do and then the links here these ripper links are pretty nice if you look at the high clearance that are on the bottom they're actually offset at the pivots so they provide a smooth transition there so that is awesome really nice design there mofo rc also does some offset links like that um, but anyways, that is the basis of all the plastic. So what my plan is, is I'm gonna get some fine surface primer on the parts I'm gonna paint, and then I'm gonna follow this up with some Tamiya TS paints. But luckily, like the chassis is black, the skid's black, things like that, so I don't wanna paint those and I don't have to because they're black. So that's super nice. So if they take scratches or whatever, you're not scratching off paint. It's just the black plastic. Um, but anyways, a little bit of uh, detailing here to do, but it's going to be fun. Cannot wait. So I think now let's take a look at the uh, actual other parts that we need to actually complete this kit and make it an RC. Okay, let's take a close look at the remainder of what we're going to need. So of course we're going to need the uh, axles so i've got this front billet super 8 axle i've got some uh, brass dubro knuckles got the cvd inner axles for that the bearing kit and some overdrive gears from little guy the little guy hardware kit and their super 8 billet steering links and i am going to use their new high powered uh, trimmer servo so this guy um, look at that 152 ounce inches at 8.4 volts, 131 at 7.4, 111 at 6. Just massive, massive torque. So I'm going to be using that. So with that larger type servo, I'm going to have to use an adjustable uh, MoFo servo tray. So I've got a brass one here, 
So we won't use that Emacs tray that's included in the kit. And then for the rear, basically the same thing, the Super 8 housing, the Super 8 inners, I've got a link riser, bearings, hardware, and then just stock gearing. Then for shocks, I'm setting this up with the 43 millimeter uh, hot racing oil, uh, long travel oil shocks. And then for uh, electronics, the trusty uh, FlySky 4 channel micro receiver to go with my FlySky GT5 and then the Lizard Ultimate. And then for motors, since I don't know exactly what's going to fit with that interior, I've got the Nano Beast V2 forward facing. I've got it in the actual reverse facing with the transfer gear that puts it basically right here, like the stock motor, super low. Um, so that may be a configuration we have to go with just depending on those seats. And then the first choice was going to be this Revenge of Pancake, but again, that may stick up too tall and may not fit. And then the final thing is we've got our male uh, axle stubs we're going to need since the kit only includes those uh, female front and rear. But uh, not too much here. And then of course uh, we'll get to wheels and tires when we get to wheels and tires. But uh, I think we're going to jump in and start getting some of this uh, built up. I've got this front axle complete, but I want to go over a few little installation tips before we move on to the rear axle. So I think I've gone over a couple of these before, but uh, for the rear diff cover, when you, when you go to the metal alloy housing, you need to use shorter screws than they tell you. So this comes with uh, eights. So you actually want to use like a six millimeter down here for these four. And then for the uh, upper on the servo tray, I actually upsize those to tens just to make sure I could get all the way through the back bracket here, get a nice uh, tight connection. And you can see the little gap there between the diff and the servo tray, but there's no wiggle. Nice tight connection there, metal on metal. So super happy with that. Um, no big deal there. For the uh, worm gear, I did have to remove one uh, O-ring to get it just buttery smooth. Two of them wasn't binding or anything, but it wasn't, it wasn't just this super buttery smooth. So that's what I always like to get. And I've got a little bit of this uh, utter butter marine grease in there as usual um, moving on i guess the cvd axles i could not get those to seat in the drive gear and the diff so i took some sandpaper sanded down the little rectangular ends and then those popped right in there i could get the knuckles on and you can see i've got full action here super nice turning um, next thing would be the steering link which is really neat it's got a beveled edge flat top um, but all of the ball hardware was installed with the flange side down, uh, the large flange. So I flipped those. I always like to have those on the outside to be more of a retainer for that O-ring. Um, and then the last thing I guess is going to be this servo horn. So this servo comes with a nice aluminum servo horn, but for the life of me, I could not even really get it started on this gear. I could barely kind of find where it wants to start. So I think I'm going to have to get it started, um, you know, just find the position and then snug it on with the screw. Um, so I don't think it'll come off very easy if I do that. So I'm going to wait till I plug this up, make sure it's centered, and I'll get this on there, hopefully. But uh, I think that wraps it up for the front axle. So let's jump in and get that rear axle done. All right, got this rear axle complete, and this thing went together super smooth, no hiccups. Uh, same installation notes on these four screws. You wanna use shorter ones on that diff cover, and then you wanna use longer ones on this uh, link riser. And I used one O-ring for the uh, worm gear. And again, no play in and out. Worked out just perfect, super smooth. A little grease in there. And then the only other thing I did was add an additional uh, bearing retainer screw. At the end, they only provide you one per side. I don't think that's necessary, but it's symmetry. So anyways, I think we are done with the uh, axles. All right, it's time to get a motor in this thing. So as you can see, I've got both of my forward facing motor mount options on the table. I've got the 3400 KV Revenge of Pancake, and then I've got the uh, Nano Beast 2.0. Forget what the KV on this guy is. I've used it a lot. It's a 
powerhouse and it's tiny. I really like this motor. Um, speaking of tiny, you can see the difference here in size for their respective motor mounts. So this uh, Revenge of Pancake motor mount is quite a bit taller. So that may cause some issues with the dash. So I've got the uh, components here we're gonna need to get installed. So the seats and dash attach to this cross member and then that screws in to each side of the cage and then the dash screws into these two points. So I'm gonna get that in, we'll drop it in the tub and then we'll fit that over and see if there's any clearance problems. So I just need to pick one to install first. Okay, got a little progress made here. Got the seats and the console in the cage. So I want to share a couple of uh, tips that I found along the way, a couple things I learned. Um, so I've got the seats and got those attached to this crossbar first. Then you kind of have to twist that, get it up in the cage and line it up here to the side. And they don't actually tell you or give you hardware for this connection. And it's a larger hole. Um, obviously it's not one of these little tiny holes for those micro screws. And you can see there's quite a bit of length on it because the connection is fairly deep. Um, so I ended up using six millimeter hardware here, but uh, while putting that six millimeter hardware in, I was actually holding the seat and screwing that in and it put enough twist on that crossbar, just pulled the seat right off. So um, luckily it didn't strip it. I was able to screw the seat back on, but going forward, I was holding kind of the center. If I needed the brace or I'd actually pinch it right here to keep it uh, from spinning. Um, but anyways, something to know, be very careful with that little hardware. I think on final assembly, I'll probably glue and screw these seats here because I feel like if they took a hard hit, they would just pop off. Um, it's just not coarse enough threads and those they're just so tiny. But uh, once you get the seats in and the crossbar, then you can kind of get the dash and twist it, get it up in the cage and line it up here and then these two mount points, they do tell you what to use and they tell you the hardware. Um, console to cage, two of these little micro coarse threads, which obviously that's incorrect. If you look at the connection, it's a larger hole. And again, this has quite a bit of depth to it, not as much as those side ones. I used a four millimeter piece of hardware here. Um, so that secured the dash and basically the dash is super secure there. So coming down here is the last two screws I put in and that's basically just to brace this crossbar and seats from wanting to uh, twist, you know, forward or backwards, but it's not really supporting the console or dash because the cage is. So anyways, that's all in and secure. Um, so that just drops in the tub and that just drops like straight down in here really nice fit just got to pop these little edges in it's such a tight fit and look at that the seat already fell back out so you know that's what i'm saying that those screws there's not a lot of bite to them um, and of course this stuff's plastic you're gonna you're gonna come up with some new curse words when you're dealing with these screws i know i already have but anyways we'll we'll deal with that seat on reassembly get that glued and screwed but anyways that's that's going on like that and then that drops right on to this chassis and you can see the shock towers line right up this keys right in so that is nice and secure so then you can see here this is what we're left with we're working with that space under the console and between the cage there so i think it's time now to finally uh, get one of these motors attached to the transmission get that in and see uh, just kind of how much room we're left with there and uh, we'll deal with this silly seat later. Well, it looks like we may have a winner. So here is the forward-facing Nano Beast, and you can see the bottom of the console just rests on top of the motor mount. It doesn't get to the motor. Let's take a peek in here. So it's not long enough. It's not anywhere near touching the motor, but it's resting right on the mount. And if you see this shock mount over here with the tub, it's flush. You see this one, it's not, but I can just squeeze it down. I mean, I could probably just attach it um, and it wouldn't matter, but I think I'll probably just take a little bit off the bottom edge there, that bottom corner, 
and I don't even think you'll probably be able to tell, but it'll just be enough to take any pressure off this tub and let it seat down perfectly flush like that. But uh, looking at the uh, ROP mount, I don't think there's any way, because once you that's up higher, you'd have to take out more of the dash. And then it looks like it may, I don't know, it, could, it might live right behind this hood hinge. It's kind of hard to tell, but it definitely require butchering a little more of that dash. So I think I'm just gonna go with this little micro guy, keep my uh, weight lower with this thing. But uh, anyways, I think that decision is made. So I think now we can probably uh, hook this motor up and give it a little test here. I did leave a little gap. You can see there from the pinion to the spur, a little bit of gap in the mesh. You want to be able to move one without the other slightly, about a piece of paper's width between there. But uh, looks like it's going to be fine. We'll have to hook it up and test it. But I think the motor selection is done and we've settled on the Nano Beast 2.0. All right, before we actually plug this up to test the motor, I thought I'd go a little further with the uh, mock up here. So I got the front fenders on and I got this front interior tray in uh, without screws, just kind of mocked them in. So you can see the fenders just kind of mount on these pegs on the inside of the tub. And then the tray drops in and it's got four mount points as well. The uh, issue I ran into was the bottom edge of the tray is barely coming into contact with the Nano Beast. It's just right there. So I'm going to have to clearance that because this is an outrunner motor, so that outer case will be spinning, so nothing wants to touch that. Um, it's also putting stress on this tray. It doesn't want to sit down nice and easy. So I have to make that clearance there, but that's very minor and it's on the bottom, so you're not going to see it. Um, I did actually get this ROP back out to double check, and while it would sit higher and it's not as deep, so it would clear the battery tray, it wouldn't have that issue. It looks like it would want to live right here where this cage member is, and I definitely don't want to take that guy out. So. I'm still happy that I chose the, uh, the little micro nano beast. I think that's going to work well with these couple little clearance mods, but uh, just another little thing to know. Okay, back with this front tray modified. So let me see if I can hold this all in place. So I've just got a test fit in there, but uh, tried to keep it as close to that motor can as possible without touching it. But uh, I think that's going to do it right there. So. I think we're moving on Let's see if we can't get this uh, console modified so I have to uninstall this interior make that tweak and then put it back in so let me do that and then we'll check our final fitment here all right got this uh, console edge modified here and you can see I just took a little notch out of that not very much at all so let's pop this in here and see if that did the trick so it feels like it did everything's sitting nice and flush on the frame Looks like it. I don't feel any tension, anything pushing up. So it looks like we just cleared it. You can see there, there's that motor mount. That looks like a perfect fit. So I can let off of this. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel any tension, nothing's pushing up. So it looks like that is perfect. I'm not even gonna be able to notice that once it's all painted up. So. I think with that little tweak right there and this little modification to the battery tray, I think that's going to do it for uh, motor fitment. Okay, it's time to get this motor plugged in and tested. So I've got my uh, electronics out on the table, basically two components here. I've got the FuryTech Lizard Ultimate in the red aluminum case here. Super nice. This is their top of the line ESC currently. I've used this a couple times and it's got a lot of nice little features we'll look at here in a second. And then I've got this uh, Flysky FS2A 4 channel micro receiver since I will be using my Flysky GT5 uh, radio. And then I've got this little styrene uh, mount for it. This is by Rockwolf Designs. So this will just double side in. So that's a handy little mounting tool for those micro guys. So not a lot of space 
is going to be taken up by these guys so that'll be good since we're working under the hood most likely for mounting but we're not going to worry about mounting just yet we're just going to get this stuff hooked up and uh, we're going to center the servo see if i can't uh, somehow squeeze this servo horn on and uh, <clears throat> get that axle servo uh, get that all set up as far as all the dual rates and endpoints but before we get to the install let's take a quick look at the ultimate specs so this guy is just super high powered as far as the VEC. It's selectable from 5, 6.5, or 8.4, and it's 3 amp. So it's just massive power right there. And it's, uh, well, it's a 40 amp constant and a 70 amp burst current. So just an incredible little micro ESC and such a nice little case there. So let's get this stuff uh, plugged up and I'll be back and we'll give this guy a little test. Okay, I think we're ready for a test here. I was able to get this servo horn on, um, just snugged it down slowly with the screw and it, uh, it went on there, but I wouldn't imagine trying to pull that thing off. So I've adjusted the uh, dual rate down on this servo to like 65%. Um, since I don't have it on the truck, I haven't uh, centered the trim precisely, but it is uh, pretty centered up here, just out of the box on the servo. So I think now let's uh, get this thing turned on and give it a little uh, test here. Feels nice and smooth. Let's see what we can do as far as the slow crawl. Super slow. So excellent. Looks like it's meshed up well. Looks like everything is working well. Let's take a look at this uh, front axle here. So this is only on uh, the mid-grade BEC, which is what, 6.5? Once I get a 3S in here, I'll pump that up to 7.4, but already pretty fast. And you can see why I turned the dual rate down this is at 65% and look how close it is. So I'm almost already getting the max out of the steering. So if this was at 100%, you could likely just snap uh, an axle if you didn't adjust it down. So I always recommend doing that before you start doing this and actually twisting it uh, or turning it. But just to be on the safe side, you definitely don't want to break an axle. So once that's on the truck, we get tires on there, can center that servo perfectly, then I will adjust the uh, actual endpoints and get this thing uh, maxed out. But I think for now, we're good to move forward. I think we're ready for final chassis assembly. So I've got everything laid out here. So I want to point out uh, the hardware that little guy provides with the ripper chassis. So they give you six four millimeters for the three points on each side of their skid. And they give you the eight eight millimeters for the uh, link points to the skid. So in addition to what I had laid out in the kind of parts overview, you're also going to need uh, U-joints for the drive shafts they provide. I didn't have those out. So in getting these out and prepping, I was taking a look here at the, I guess, C10 rear. That's the exact same size as the front axle they provide. And then I've got a deadbolt rear out here next to the rear shaft that they provide, which is a little bit longer. But I actually got to looking at the engagement here with this uh, male shaft, and there's a stop built in. So taking that stop into consideration, this thing is a lot longer and there's really not a ton of engagement with that uh, inner. So I may run this uh, deadbolt rear. You can see here it's a little longer, but the deadbolt rear gets full engagement. So it could actually slide in further and it would definitely have uh, more engagement as far as the inner axle portion. So. That may be an option to uh, not run their printed shafts at all and just use those two I've got on the table. So I may try that first. And then the last thing I've got out, of course, are the oil-filled 43 millimeter long travel shocks. And I've used these before. I really like them. They have the removable bottom spring collar, just like uh, one tenths. You can slide that off to the side, drop the spring, 
change spring rates really quickly without taking off the cap and having to refill the oil. So these do not come with oil in them and that's why I've got the 30 weight on the table. So I will fill these up and I think I'm going to start with the black springs they come with which are the softest. The silver are the firms and I think I'm going to go to golds in the rear for the medium to start with. So I'm going to jump in, get these uh, shocks filled with oil, get everything assembled, and we can take a look at what this chassis looks like as a slider. Assembly note here, I was getting this uh, transmission screwed in, and these uh, little four millimeters they provide you just don't bite at all. They just go in and spin. If you look at kind of the thickness of this frame, these do recess in, but you see there's still not much bite at all. So I ended up using... Uh, I believe eights on the front two and then I used a six on the back because an eight wouldn't fully seat the head. The head here is just barely out. Uh, these two are perfectly kind of flush but uh, I mean it's just barely out. So I could go to a six there but I think I'm gonna leave eights in there and uh, they did you know screw in and then finally kind of bite at the end but go very soft. Um, these things can strip out super easy, but at least I've got a lot more kind of length in there holding that connection. But uh, I don't know why they give you fours. Those things are just super tiny. But anyways, another little tip. You may want to have some extra hardware on hand. I always have tons of hardware to pick from. So you can see I stole some eights there, so I have to replace those out of my bags. But anyways, just another little tip. Man, I got a mess here. So, little mid-chassis build update. So, I guess first on the hardware for all of the links to the skid, I found that to be too short. They provide you eight millimeters, and I swapped up to tens. You can see on the rears, it just pokes through, and on the fronts, it flushes out uh, just perfectly. So, I would definitely upsize to tens. And then for the rear, I initially installed that deadbolt drive shaft, thinking, okay, this will work. Where's that guy? Um, let me hold it up here. And it didn't. It ended up being too long. I couldn't get the links on. And you can see it's just a hair too long. So I went back to revisit the drive shaft they provide. And uh, I was able to kind of take a tool, run it up in here. And there was basically a bunch of plastic and center kind of print stuff in there. And then tap that out on the table. That's what all this dust and junk is. And that was able to give me full engagement and you can see here it's engaged a lot further than it was and there's really not a lot of movement it's very slight uh, with the amount of travel of this uh, axle and then that's the uh, I guess the third thing it's just the travel of the axle it's limited in the up travel by these uh, lower high clearance links they act as the bump stop so that is your full compression so keep that in mind when thinking about shocks. It may make me go to a telescoping shock that can actually compress down to that 32 millimeter compression. Um, you know, it, it's small as the stock shocks. So anyways, that's something to maybe look at later once I get the body and wheels and tires on here and just, you know, there's no idea. I have no idea about clearances yet. So I think I'm going to move to the front end, get that on, and hopefully there'll be no hitches there I think I'm going to go ahead and use the printed shaft. It seems to work fine. Full engagement on this, very smooth. So hopefully I'll have this together shortly. Quick shot here of the assembled frame. And uh, look at the caster on this front axle. That's just insane. Um, that servo looks like it's going to get way up into that tray. Not that I can compress that far with these shocks. And then the dropout is quite a bit more limited and that's due to the the links hitting the back of that servo because that servo is so deep um, i've run into this before where i wanted extreme articulation so i actually had to use upside down high clearance links in that position so they kind of came out straight and then went up and that solved it but uh, <clears throat> i'm just looking at this thinking man is that right it just seems like those front uppers are too short um, the servo is kind of in the pinched part of the frame. I mean, maybe this was just, you know, I know this was designed for the smaller servo, smaller servo tray. Maybe that's the difference, but 
I may be making some adjustments to that front end, uh, just depending, but it looks like I'm not going to even be able to get that much drop out with my 43 millimeter shocks. I'm going to be somewhere in this range, I believe. But uh, like if you had the 54s, you couldn't even get that, or the 58s. Um, so that's something to know. You may, if you want that super long articulation, those long shocks, you may have to use some modified upper link. Or the other solution, you could scoot the servo forward, and uh, but that's just going to pull your drag link out and uh, it's going to actually put it higher at this caster angle. So, you know, it may be a combo of getting longer upper links to adjust that caster forward just a little more to level that servo. Um, I don't want to fully level it, but man, that's just, that's really extreme. But it's really hard to know until the body's on there and we can kind of look at all of this. But just want to kind of point that out. And one other thing is, uh, did not end up using the printed drive shaft. As you can see, it snapped when I was trying to get the U-joint in and uh, this piece went flying somewhere. But I've got the stock uh, rear JLU C10 and it's the same length, so it doesn't seem like any difference there. But anyways, I'm gonna go ahead, fill these shocks with oil, get them on there and just see how it sits. A few steps forward, a few steps back. So I got the shocks filled with oil, got those mounted up and then just started looking at this front end and thinking, you know, something is just not right. The more I thought about it, so you can see I pulled the drive shafts just to double check those, and those are the same. I went and double checked the length of all the links on Little Guy's site to make sure I had the correct ones, and I do. So ultimately, I found the culprit here, and it is the servo tray. So you can see the mofo servo tray here on the bottom. So I've got that lined up with the uh, Emax alloy tray they give you. You can see how much longer it is. So I've effectively lost some length of those upper links. So what I've done here is pulled out a bunch of spares that I've got that have these screw on ends. These are in Jora. So they're in essence adjustable. So I've got some deadbolt lowers. So these are high clearance and these are 41s. So I ought to be able to unthread these to replace these uh, little guy uppers. And the uppers in there now I think are like 39.75. They're something right at 40. So these 41s unthreaded should work just fine and that ought to lean that servo up and get it more in this uh, widened out portion of the frame and get it just out from wanting to hit that battery tray. So all in all, I think that's gonna really help the front geometry, but uh, not a big deal. But when you start using you know, alternate parts than what they provide, it causes some issues. So nothing that we can't solve here with some extra links, but that's why it's always good to have some spare stuff on hand when you're doing some builds, especially something like this with a lot of, uh, a lot of discovery, I will say. Okay, I've got those uh, alternate upper links swapped in and I've got those extended out about four millimeters right now to about 43 and a half millimeter total eye to eye. So I'm looking at maybe going a little bit further forward uh, with the servo. That's why I went ahead and mocked everything up to do kind of a final fitment. So the, the winch here kind of covers that grill gap and the winch is actually cut out to allow for the servo horn to have some space you know, just like the grill is there. So I've got this kind of mocked up. I've got the tray in there. So let me take this hood off. Hopefully it won't all fall apart. So the hood's off, the tray's in. So let me get this off the support and bring it over. So the grill's in place. Let me hold the tray down flush. So that's the max it can drop right there. And it looks like that servo horn is just above the grill. You see they're just above the grill there. So if I lean it forward, it'll lower that servo horn a little bit. But honestly, if I stop my travel somewhere in here, then I think I should be fine. Um, so now that we've kind of checked that, let's pull this off. I'll show you kind of the links. Get the tub off. But with those reversed high clearance links, you can see the dropout that I now get 
before I was getting stopped by the back edge of the servo, hitting the link somewhere in here. So if you want to run some extremely long shocks, get a lot of travel, then this is a good way to do it. You just have to come out straight and go up and then you, you don't hit the back edge of that servo. So that's working out well. You can see how much more level that is now overall. The, uh, the one issue I'm still kind of running into here is I'm barely catching the back edges of the servo tray. You can see right there, just getting pinched. And of course the cord. So I'm pulling that tight, trying to train that. But the mounts now are kind of in that wide space. But you can see there, that's why I want to go a little bit further. The chassis starts to flare. So I'm thinking if I can get the servo pushed a little forward more, then I may be able to miss these back corners of the tray. If not, I'll just take a Dremel and chamfer those off. But I do have some room to go to the uh, front bumper here. So that's why I was just doing that one last kind of body panel fitment to make sure. But I think I'm going to pull these links back off and push the servo just a little bit further forward. And that should get it kind of perfectly level with the bottom of that tray when it's sitting right about here. So one more little tweak and we'll see if we've got this set up and then we'll get the shocks on there. And speaking of shocks, got the oil in there. Just super nice action on those. So moving right along. Okay, I adjusted those upper links out to about 45 millimeters and that did push that servo horn up. So it's right under the path of the grill. Um, so we're gonna do one little final fitment here. Clearance check. So let me hold the tray down, hold the frame. Nice, so the servo hits the tray before the servo horn can contact the grill because it's right under the grill. So if I let off the tray and drop it, you know, the, the grill will rest on that servo horn, but we're not gonna be able to compress the servo into the chassis like this. So basically this is our stop right there. So we're still good. And then uh, it doesn't look like I'm gonna have to trim those back corners of that servo tray just because we're limited. Um, well, we may hit it on twist, so I may take a look at that. That may still be an issue, but not a big one really. I just, you know, we're not, we're not literally getting up this deep because we're well above that ledge of the tray right here. So I think that's gonna uh, take care of that axle placement, servo placement. So I think we're all fitted up. So the next thing is, uh, let me get those front shocks on and we'll take a quick look at it. All right, this thing's starting to look like a Jeep right here with the shocks on. So I've got these front ones on, so I wanna do one final compression test here to check that servo. So these are those 43 millimeters. They're in the uppermost position on the shock towers. So look at that. So we are all good. We've still got about three millimeters probably of clearance there. So if I went to a shorter shock, I would most likely have to use a lower uh, shock mount. But right now these are at the very top ones available. So initially I thought that was not gonna be great, but it looks like you can't get too much lower uh, because of that. So these may work out just fine. But uh, speaking of the shocks, let's take a little look at these. So these shock towers are kind of different. They actually angle inward towards the bottom. So I took out an O-ring here to loosen this connection at the top because if you tight, you can see the screw is actually angled down. Um, so these shocks wanted to naturally angle in and these super eights are, you know, out further. So I added a little I guess it may be a one mil spacer on front and rear at the shock tops as well. And uh, that seems to be giving me nice smooth action. But uh, I think that pretty much sets up the chassis right there. Well, unfortunately, I think I've gone about as far as I can go today with the uh, current status of the weather I'm having. There's not gonna be any painting getting done, but I think it's a pretty good uh, push so far. I think we've made good progress. Got the chassis set up and basically solved some motor fitment issues and then the front end, you know, suspension setup. That was, of course, a little bit of a 
little bit of a discovery there with that different uh, servo tray. But really, all that's left, we've got paint and body work, get that painted, assembled, get the electronics in. Of course, I want to do some lighting, so we'll throw that in as well, and then wheels and tires. So we'll save that for part two, and I think for now, we've got this wrapped up. But of course, I think this was the probably the more challenging piece of the build, you know, probably what more people need a little info on than just getting something painted and assembled. But with that said, I think we're going to leave it here for today. And uh, as always, thanks for coming along on the build process. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Uh, definitely I did on this one, whole new platform, basically minus, you know, some of the components. But uh, until next time, thanks for watching.